if I have a stated objective, 80 year lifespan, and I want it to be 150, that would have been a pipe dream any other time in existence. And now you can say, here's how we might go about doing that. We can kind of do anything. We are now finally the architects of reality. That is Brian Johnson. After selling his company Braintree Venmo to PayPal for $800 million over a decade ago, Brian's dabbled in the worlds of investing in audacious foundational science out of his fund, OS Fund, and in the world of brain-computer interfaces with a wearable neuroimaging headset company called Kernel. But today, he's embarking on a new, more audacious mission, Don't Die. To get here, Brian created a thought experiment. Think about what will matter most, not in 10 years, not in 50 or even a lifetime, but hundreds and hundreds of years from now. When we look back at previous centuries, we typically can discern just a handful of things that changed the entire course. 99.9% .9 of what we do today is going to be lost to history. No one's gonna care. The human mind has been the superior form of intelligence on this earth for quite some time. Computational intelligence is now exceeding us in many ways and it will probably surpass us in all ways. His mission and longevity is called Project Blueprint, a protocol in diet, sleep, and exercise where every calorie ingested, every minute slept, every muscle worked is meticulously tracked and optimized by Brian and a team of scientists. It costs him $2 million every year. And it's made him the most measured human in history. We know things that are healthy for you and things that can kill you, but there's a lot of gray area in between. Does a cigarette kill you? What about a drink? How much? By routinely measuring everything in his body, Brian can tell you. Three years into following this algorithm, he's now accumulating aging damage slower than the average 10-year-old. It legit works. If I could go back in time and tell myself how well I would feel right now, I wouldn't believe it. Living longer and being healthy longer allows you to play the game a longer time. People investing in longevity, it could be the highest producing investment of their entire life. Nothing could yield potentially better gains. Brian wasn't always like this. He grew up in a religious community that champions storytelling. But after developing a distrust in the world around him, and eventually even himself, he left in pursuit of objective truths, and eventually an algorithm that could take better care of him than he can himself. But Brian's own experiences give him a glimpse into how he might get more people bought into the philosophy of don't die, and the ways in which people tend to push back. Growing up, I trusted adults. And then I trusted institutions. Then I trusted myself. I am no longer interested in what I have to say. When I contemplate how to take care of myself, I am not as good as an algorithm. They're actually gonna be like 99% predictable what they're gonna say. Half the group's like, what, is this a cult? Who am I? What game do I play? Do I have status anymore? Do I have power? Do I have respect? Do I have uh, a reason to live? Do, what, what do I want? We spoke about biographies and genius, zeroth principles thinking, AI and foundational technologies, living forever, free will, learning how to swim, and what makes life worth living. To me, it's just like, it's so amazing to be alive. Yes, it's like life has been hard. And, um, I really don't want it to end. How long do you think you can live? I'll respond with what I think is the most revolutionary thought or principle of what I'm trying to do. Oh, this is camera. Hi, friend. This is the LaBoss here podcast. We choose to go to the angle We deliver right to the desktop. We're gonna reinvent the phone. Oh, thanks to the camera. I want to start with Braintree, actually. Braintree was named after Braintree, Massachusetts, yeah. the birthplace of John Adams. You've read a massive number of biographies to date, you know, probably hundreds at this point. I'm curious what people you found yourself emulating most or learning the most from. Yeah, the John Adams experience was, it was my first time, he was one of the first biographies I read. And when I read the story of the American Revolution through his perspective, I realized that the versions of the history I had heard about, primarily the characters of Washington and Jefferson, dominated the story as the celebrity founding fathers. Hamilton got substantially less credit and Adams and others. And so the storytelling of humans took those events, constructed them in a certain way, and then I'd lived before reading these biographies in that abstract land. But then in reading the stories, I was able to transport myself in time to be there. And it was a reminder of me that History and almost all things are not as they are perceived. If you want to truly understand reality, you need to dig in and live the experience yourself. And so I did that after Braintree of uh, this observation that um, 
of a truth-seeking mission of always trying to get at the, the yeah, the source. Mm. Core to the belief system here, I think across the board, whether really anything that you're doing these days, is this concept of zeroth principles thinking, which I think might best be explained through you know, this purported difference between talent and genius, right? This concept that ta uh, talent is hitting the target no one else can hit, genius is hitting what no one else can see. So the question is this, I mean, how do you see the target no one else can? Like, is the frontier itself ever difficult to identify? Yeah, so a good example of zeroth principle discovery is Einstein's special theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was Newtonian physics that defined the reality. He came through and pulled it out of another dimension, literally. It's, you can't arrive at zeroth principle insights from first principle thinking, or rather it's pretty hard. And the same is true with the discovery that there's bacteria that causes infection. So before that, when doctors were delivering babies or performing surgeries without cleaning their hands, mm. infection rate was high, death was high, but it was outside the re resolution of the eye to see these, this tiny microscopic world. And so you wouldn't necessarily arrive at bacteria being the culprit of death if you're working from first principles. Mm. And so zero principle thinking is basically working in the unknown unknown and it's very hard to arrive there because you can't just follow a path of, I know this thing, I know this thing, therefore I can bridge this thing. Mm. You're kind of pulling things out of nowhere. So it's a very challenging thing to do. As we start to talk about Blueprint here, one of the core insights was that, you know, in many ways, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed, right? A lot of what you did differently was this like painstaking aggregation, right? Of a lot of the existing work to realize it's already pretty compelling. I want to tie this in here. A hero of yours is Ernest Shackleton, um, who led three British expeditions to the Antarctic. You have your own Shackleton sniff test uh, to determine whether you're pursuing the most audacious endeavor you could. So what is Blueprint to set the stage here? And why was it what you chose to pursue? It was the result of a thought experiment of hanging out with people in the 25th century. Mm -hmm. And you're listening, listening in on a conversation and they're marveling at the 21st century when you and I exist right now. Mm -hmm. And they're like, wow amazing that they figured out blank in that century that allowed intelligent existence to continue to thrive. I wanted to find that insight. When we look back at previous centuries, we typically can discern just a handful of things that the entire century turned on that changed the entire course. And we still look back and we're like, obvious, but in that time, it was impossibly hard to see it. Mm. And so the question is, if we try to sober up right now and we realize that 99.9% .9 of what we do today is going to be lost to history. Mm. No one's going to care. We care, but no one else is going to care. So you go to the 25th century of the 0.01% of all the things we did remain, what is it? And that's what I've been trying to discern for the past few years. Before we get into the specifics of Blueprint, at the core of what you're aiming to do here is a mastery of cells, right? Cooperating toward reducing entropy, toward reducing disorder in, in the system that is your body. Um, but maybe eventually like in other domains too. So to walk through this, you use the example of uh, Thomas Paine, right, in Common Sense, making the argument that the monarch is ignorant, right? Your brain doesn't necessarily know what's best for your body uh, and that democracy is better be because, because local governance being, you know, the rest of your body knows what's best for itself. So um, we'll get into Blueprint, but in, in what other areas does this apply in your mind? Planet Earth, mm. uh, definitely. We treat our bodies like we treat planet Earth. It's a parallel relationship, it's in the mirror and uh, it'd be the same way you could take planet Earth, just replace my body with planet Earth. You measure planet Earth with millions of measurements, the soil and the atmosphere, and the toxins. You look at scientific evidence on what do we need to have a thriving biosphere. Mm. You implement the protocol and you do that again and again. Data, science, protocol, data, science, protocol. And that's how we solve climate on this planet. Mm. Uh, right now, we do whatever we want to the planet uh, with almost like reckless, reckless abandon some constraints, but not really. Mm. And that's the same way we do, same thing we do to our body. So yeah, it's a system uh, that's applicable to self, to each other, to the planet, to building AI. It's, I would propose the, potentially the guiding philosophy of the 21st century that helps us understand what we do in this moment. More specifically here, you're now accumulating aging damage slower than the average 10 year old with yeah. 50 clinically perfect biomarkers and 100 lower than your chronological age. So. I guess kind of two pronged question here. One is how surprised are you that this has gone as well as it has <laughs> so far? And secondly, what's been the most like shocking perceptible difference in like day to day life yeah. uh, as opposed to two years ago? It legit works. It's not a trendy, cute, cool sounding thing. It just works. Mm. And 
I've done it, every, uh, many other people have done it, it just works every time. So that's cool. And going into this, I had been down the path of trying to improve my health with many doctors, and it was always hit and miss. Mm -hmm. You know, I won some places, I lost others, but I could never do whole body wellness like I have now. And so that's what's really surprising to me is that it, across the board, it has been spectacular. And then I never would have believed myself if I if I could have under if if I could go back in time and tell myself how well I would feel right now, I wouldn't believe it. Mm. Never in my entire life. Even as a kid, you know, like your youth camouflages so much damage. You know, sleep, a lack of sleep, and eating junk food. But even as a child, I mean, I was eating a lot of bad food. I didn't sleep very well. We didn't prioritize it. Uh, I don't know if I ever have felt this good in my entire life. To get to the, I guess, deeper sort of levels here, right? Like diet, sleep, and exercise are obviously a big part of the equation, but they get you so far, mm -hmm. right? In order to sort of punch through the ceiling with longevity of you know, 120 or so yeah. in humans means working at the genetic level. So you recently underwent gene therapy to increase the, the level of polystatin expression in your body. Um, so I guess, what does gene therapy do? Uh, and what were the results, if you're willing to share them? Yeah, the, the backstory of that is we went through every single scientific uh, publication ever done on a high, uh, health span, lifespan. Then we used 15 biostatistical criteria. And we said, which studies do we think has the best evidence? And then we've been knocking out systematically every single one we can. And so this, this particular gene therapy ranked number seven as the most powerful ever done uh, with the over 30 percent lifespan a uh, lifespan extension and yeah so we uh, the other ones we haven't done because they're either inaccessible or they're not yet safe but this one we felt like uh fit and you're right this is how we punch through the 120 limitation that we see almost across the board do you feel any differently uh subjectively i don't know um uh, i feel so good already it's pretty hard to move the needle on how how well i feel yeah but my markers are definitely improving. Mm. Okay, as far as longevity is concerned, there's like this interesting anti-longevity stance that comes from Elon Musk who thinks people don't change their minds, they just die. Um, rather than ask you whether you think this is compelling at all, I think you know it's probably a no. Um, I'm curious to hear if you've thought about any particularly interesting first or second order effects of people across the board living much longer lives. Yeah. Uh we live in a, cap a capitalistic society. It is the thing that runs most of our behaviors. We're, we seek power and wealth and status and authority. Mm. And in this framework, living longer and being healthy longer allows you to play the game a longer time. And most importantly, it allows you to play the game longer when your gains are compounding. So when you're in your late 40s and 50s and 60s, you've gotten pretty good at what you're doing. You maybe even have some money that you've built up and it's starting to build upon itself. Mm. And in those moments, that's when you start declining physically. And so you can't really take advantage of the skills you've acquired and the wealth you've now created. And so it kind of hits at the worst time when you really could start compounding that. Mm. And so you, people investing in longevity, it could be the highest producing investment of their entire life. Nothing could yield potentially better gains. Mm. Do you feel like your relationship with time has changed at all, right? Like in a sense, you're aging in reverse in some categories. And I think like, you know, the typical stoic thing is like memento mori, like remember you're gonna die, yeah. uh, that should drive you in life. What is your relationship with that? This is what I think the 25th century observes mm. is don't die is deceptively simple. Mm. It is potentially the most rich philosophy we've ever had. Okay, so diet, sleep, exercise, gene therapy now. Let's talk about measurement, right? At the core of this whole thing is this concept of biological versus chronological age. Chronologically, you're 46, I think. Mm -hmm. I guess measuring your, your biological age um, can you kind of walk through that and what you look at to determine that number for different parts of your body? Yeah. So an easy way to understand this is if you looked at a baby's heart and a 90 year old heart, mm. they look and function differently. And that's true for a 10 year old and a 20 year old and 30 year old. So our body looks and acts, you know, functions a lot differently across the various ages. So you can just simply look at a biological process or an organ like the heart or liver or lungs and say, how old are you? Mm. <laughs> and you can tease out the origin organ age based upon 
the anatomical characteristics and the functional characteristics. And that's what we've done across my entire body is we've tried to bioage every single part of my body. To talk about, I guess, getting this out to, to more people and what this maybe looks like at scale or in the future. Um, I remember interviewing the founder of uh, like a continuous glucose monitor startup mm -hmm. a while back, and he said something that really stuck with me, which was something along the line of, lines of, you know, we have dashboards for like practically everything in life, you know, uh, appliances, markets, cars, apps, practically yeah. everything except yeah. our bodies. Yeah. Um, so on a way to a future where everyone has access to this and, and has like a personalized version of this protocol, maybe um, you're hoping to make it easier for folks by selling some of its larger sort of 2080 constituent components, starting with olive oil, presumably some other stuff in the future. Um, that said, I interviewed um, a, a VC, uh, Keith Raboy at Founders Fund like a, a, a few weeks ago, and he was talking about how so much of this for people and getting them to buy into it lies in the feedback, right? Actively seeing how any of this is affecting your body. So the long question here is, is as someone who puts so much painstaking effort into measurement, what do you think the future of wearables looks like? Yeah, <laughs> I, um, I was uh, teaching one of my children to swim and <laughs> I did a quick online search. I don't know if this has any evidence behind it, yeah. but I Googled something like, what is the best way to teach a child to swim? Yeah. And so the options are you can be by your child and push them into the pool. You can get them into the pool and invite them to be in the pool, or you can show them their friend getting in the pool and swimming. And of those three, it's the friend. We are social creatures, we're tribal, we like to belong, we don't want to be ostracized, we want to be in, not mm. out. And I know that the left part of the brain is, you know, it's data and dashboards and but you know what, we just want to be a part of community. Mm. And when other people are doing these things, we want to as well. And I think that's oftentimes the simplest answer, which is what I'm trying to do with Blueprint generally. Optimizing personal health is cool, sure, yeah. but really we exist to be with each other. That's the whole thing. And so if we do that and it's just part of a norm, these dashboards go away. But I mean, I want, like we've talked about a dashboard individually with wearables. I want to know that the people in charge in society are in a place to make good judgment on the decisions they're making. So we know if someone drinks alcohol and they're inebriated, we say, you can't drive. You've had your decision authority revoked. Yeah. But if you've had a bad night's sleep, you're also inebriated, but you're still making decisions like you are. Mm. And so I want to know dashboards of society that are people that are making decisions on behalf of a large number of us, are they in the right capacity to be making those decisions? Mm. This is maybe a nice segue. Um, one of your favorite books is Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, great book, it's one of mine too. The narrator and his friend are set up in this book as direct contrasts, yeah. right? Um, narrator's friend has a, a fancy new motorcycle, doesn't really care about learning how to repair it. Narrator has a vintage one and really finds joy in like making it last as long as he can. If you go a bit deeper though, the narrator addresses this pivotal question of how to pursue technology in a way that enriches human life yeah. as opposed to degrading it. So the question for you, which you know maybe has some nuance here, is like in the context of Blueprint, do you think there's a line of enrichment of, of sort of longevity and extending life versus a sacrifice of the experiences that make up that life for you and then maybe for people in general? Yeah. This is, um, I'll respond with what I think is the most revolutionary thought or principle of what I'm trying to do. Mm. I am fundamentally arguing that the human mind has been the superior form of intelligence on this earth for quite some time. We take it for granted that we just assume that. Computational intelligence is now exceeding us in many ways and it will probably surpass us in all ways. The game of, oh, but we're gonna be better at blank, it's just not a game to bet on. Mm. We're going to be surpassed on every level mm. soon. That raises the question of when these algorithms can take better care of us than we can ourselves. We're going to be in this interesting place where we've been the meaning making players. Like we can pose these questions like, what does it mean to live a good life? And what does it mean to, and we presuppose here that we are the architects of our reality. And what I'm proposing is we're walking into a new state of being in this area where we're not quite sure who's running the show. An algorithm's running me, and I know when I sleep well, when I eat certain things, I'm physically changed as a human. It's not like I'm like, oh, hold these variables tight. Like I change, and the way I think and the way I feel alters dramatically. 
what does it mean to be me at that point in time? And so it's this emergent consciousness as we become increasingly intertwined with artificial intelligence, where it's not quite clear where we begin and where we end yeah. and what the algorithm is and what it's not. And this is, it's scary initially because it, it challenges this notion we have, which is sacred, which is like, I'm an independent unit. I decide all things. I will be the person to put forward the ethical and moral and philosophical debate table for all things we're going to discuss. Maybe there's an end, maybe we're at the end of that phase. And this is, I've been hosting dinners for several years and I talk about this in much more depth. It takes two and a half hours to get this idea out and to land. <laughs> because when I say it, even people listening right now, yeah. they're going to need your reaction and just say, they're actually gonna be like 99% predictable what they're gonna say. They're, just, they're gonna just repeat the zeitgeist of current 2023 thinking. Mm. But that's really, I think where we're at is, um, it may be time to play a new game as a species, a game so foreign and so alien, it breaks our brains. What does that mean more practically? I understand the, the idea is that you can't even begin to think about projecting out uh, into the future because you know we should probably be assuming that we, we don't even know the right questions to be asking in the first place, but how long do you think you can live? No one knows. This is the thing. This is why don't die matters. Nobody knows if there is a upper bound limit to how long and how well we can live. No one. When, when you look at this situation on a macro scale and you just say how fast is computational intelligence improving, at that point in time, the only thing that intelligence cares about is continuing its existence. And so in this, I would basically say, um, I am no longer interested in what I have to say. Mm. I don't care what my opinions are. I don't care what I think I want in the future. I don't care what I want now. I don't care what my mind says, period. Mm. This future is going to be something that I can't even, I'm, I'm basically the equivalent of Homo erectus that existed one million years ago. I would laugh at Homo erectus's opinions as they contemplate the future of existence. I would laugh at myself, at anything I would, I would try to generate to say, is the future worth living for? So in talking about blueprint as like this contemplation of the future of mm -hmm. existence and this understanding that like you should probably be buying into an algorithm that can take better care of you than you can yourself because you have, you know, sort of not great judgment, not great willpower, and, yeah. you know, the yeah. slew of 180 something cognitive biases. Yes. Um, you mentioned the blueprint brunches and you kind of sit people down and walk them through this thought experiment of like, you can buy in and the algorithm blueprint takes better care of you than you can yourself, but you have to buy in completely. You mentioned just earlier that people have these very predictable responses. Yeah. What are the, what are the camps that people fall into? <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to do this in 60 seconds. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, two minutes. Okay. Okay. So here's what happens. I give, I give the thought experiment of if there's an algorithm that can give you near perfect health, uh, but in exchange for that it, near perfect intellectual, emotional, spiritual health, but in exchange for that, you do what the algorithm says. Mm -hmm. So you go to bed in time when it does and you know, et cetera. So a, a camp's gonna say, um, yes, anything to save me for myself, great, mm -hmm. cool. The next camp is gonna be like, well, yes, but like here's some conditions. Lol, not the, not the thought experiment, <laughs> <laughs> that's not it. And then the, like half of the group's like, what, is this a cult? Yeah. You're like, fuck off. Yeah, like, it, yeah. It's a really violent reaction because it's like, no, 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 no. I'm an autonomous being. My value is my autonomous well-being. An algorithm's never gonna be better at me and like all these things of like they're very offended. So then I flip it around and I say, if we're going to sober up, let's imagine we're looking at ourselves from the vantage point of the 25th century. We know that most everything we think and believe and the way we act, it's all gonna be washed away in a decade. Mm -hmm. Like we're gonna be part of history. And so there's nothing right now that's sacred except for we just believe these things right now for certain reasons. So what is it that we're actually, what do we believe? Like, can we? shine a, we put a mirror to this moment and then you flip it around so then people are observing themselves and they're like oh okay well a common thing that we do today is blank like we perceive autonomy is the ultimate expression of being human that's interesting and that thought process could shift so then i uh, walk people through this thought experiment and we get to the end and here's the punchline the future is going to take away all of our ones and replace them with zeros and what that means is one uh, is first principle thinking. Like we know how to make money. We know how to save money. We know how to acquire status and power. We know how to create social, like we know all these things. We know math, we know blank. 
Like we are, we own the certain environment, we play certain games, mm. but everything we know and care about is potentially going to be just swept away because artificial intelligence is going to come and introduce zeros, which is basically new ideas, concepts from another dimension and rewrite reality. So it's going to take away everything we know and are familiar with and give us back in return brand new concepts. And so people get hit on both sides emotionally. You take away from them everything they care about and you give to them total unknown. And that's why people fall into existential crisis during these dinners is it's like, what do you do with that? Like, who am I? What game do I play? Do I have status anymore? Do I have power? Mm. Do, do I have respect? Do I have uh, a reason to live? Do, what, what do I want? And that's why it's such a fantastic group discussion. So we always make our way out. And at the end, people reconcile, but um, this is, it's very hard to argue that artificial intelligence is not going to rewrite our reality wholesale. It's very hard to believe that we're gonna somehow be able to architect existence, you know, like we're just, we don't have that capacity anymore. Alfred North Whitehead has this great quote that goes, civilization advances by extending the number of operations that we can perform without thinking about yeah. them. Of course, and I think this ties into some of your argument is that we're already kind of on our way there, yeah. right? Um, give a lot of ourselves over to, you know, Google Maps yeah. to get me from yeah. point A to point B. Me scrolling through social media is, you know, mediated by an algorithm, right? Any information that I'm sort of taking in. I guess the bigger question here for me is, do you think optimal civilization scale goal alignment means the complete removal of free will? Does everything become an algorithm? I just finished Sapolsky's book on free will. It is phenomenal. And he, if he does, even if he doesn't solve the debate on whether or not a person has free will, what he shows is that question, the question of why we do what we do and do we really have control over that is such a nuanced and layered conversation. Unless you've dug into the literature equal to Sapolsky of being aware of his arguments, it's really hard to even comment on it. And so I would just say as a, a summary, you know, is there a free will? Do we know if we're experiencing free will? If we aren't experiencing free will, do we even know it? In the future, if we don't have free will, will we even know we've lost it? Mm. It's such an ambiguous thing. It's fleeting, it's nuanced. Uh, you know, like if, if you take Ozembic, are you, have you lost a portion of your free will? Because you no longer have hung, hunger signals. You, you, like this pill changes your biochemistry, hmm. but turns off. Like, are you basically foregoing free will? Now, like people are gonna say yes, they're gonna know, they're gonna make various arguments, but these are the things like when you start doing things that alter you as a person, what are you doing to your free will? And this is the debate I think is relevant. And it's, you're right, we're gonna walk into the future. We are going to say yes to the things that help us achieve our objectives. We're gonna give very little thought to the overall philosophical uh, contemplations. Hmm. You said that, you know, in order to get people sort of um, bought into this whole thing, um, we need a pretty major cognitive revolution, like a, an overhaul here. It seems we haven't fundamentally evolved that much though, right? Yeah. Like yeah. ultimately the same drivers, the same fears, yeah. like how plastic is our neurology really for everybody to kind of suddenly wake up and say, you know what, actually I'm going to buy into the algorithm. Um, and I, that's a choice that I'm willing to make because yeah. it doesn't in my mind anyway, comport with you got, you know, power, money, yeah. sex, what, whatever, anything else. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's as easy as seeing your friend get in the pool. Hmm. If they are and they're having fun and they're making friends doing it and they're getting along with others and they're going on dates and mm -hmm. you're like, others are going to get in the pool too. And that's just how we are. I don't think it needs to be a big philosophical revolution. People just need to see that other people are achieving their objectives of the same things we all care about and it will shift. Let's talk about the types of people that I guess have started buying into this, you being obviously the first. Um, on one of the very first days of your MBA, you were given questions to answer and everybody in your group was apparently talking about, uh, you know, cost models and distribution channels. Um, and you were asking like how the founder's marriage was and if they were getting enough <laughs> sleep at night, right? Yeah. So yeah. I guess, I mean, I would venture yeah. to guess the other four people in that group were not selling companies for hundreds of millions of dollars later on. 
Um, how much of people's willingness to commit to something as radical of, as this is, is inherent rather than learned? And maybe yeah. it goes back to the pool argument. Yeah. Yeah, that is a question I do not have expertise to answer. I could move my lips and say something, but it would mean nothing. Fair enough. Um, you have this, this conviction that we're about to experience an evolutionary transition on a scale that we've never seen before, um, driven in large part by AI and computational intelligence to, to physically, predictably engineer atoms, molecules, and organisms. Yeah. Um, what does this actually mean more practically? Like, what does that future, in as much fidelity as you're able, look okay. like? Yep. If I have a stated objective where I have a, a set, you know, 80 year lifespan and I want it to be 150, mm -hmm. and I want that lifespan to be health, as healthy as an 18 year old, like I want the same uh, biological characteristics of an 18 year old, that would have been a pipe dream any other time in existence. And now you can say, okay, actually, here's how we might go about doing that. And it may be organ replacements, it may be changing, you know, it may be uh, working on epigenetic changes, it may be gene therapies. And even if those things are not available right now, you can see structurally, biologically, how they would actually happen. Mm. Now there's unknowns there, but if you ask this question in the 16th century, we didn't have the understanding of DNA. We didn't have the understanding of biological processes. It was very, so uh, the fact that we have an understanding and we have the actual tools to manipulate atoms and organisms and molecules to do pretty much anything we want. It's just a matter of time for us to figure out exactly how to do that given thing in some safe way. But like, we're there, like we have actually arrived. And this is why I'm saying we've arrived at the point in time where don't die becomes the dominant philosophy of existence. And this is, you said the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. The future is always here. The question is, can we see it? Mm. And that's the challenge of every generation is that the majority of people that live in any time and place are oblivious to the future. It was there, we read about it. It was there in their communities. And they either saw it and they dismissed it as crazy. They saw it and they you know, were skeptical of it, whatever the case may be, but it's always the case. And so it's, it's no different right now. The future is here. So the question is, you know, don't die is an idea that many people think is crazy, but are you falling prey just like billions of other people have fallen prey to not seeing the future in their time and place when it did arrive? It seems like humanity is going to have some difficult questions to contend with under this pretense, right? Like things like, do we, you know, genetically modify our children? Do we merge with AI? Uh, stuff like that. What are some of the other biggest questions that you think humanity is going to have to contend with? Yeah, that's such a hard question because uh, the framing of that question loads in my mind everything I know about what's happening in 2023. Mm. And I have to basically go through my process and say, okay, that's prob none of that's probably gonna be carryover. Mm -hmm. Some may be residual, but it's really a thought exercise to say, what's the zeroth principle insight here? Mm. So, I, okay, so I guess my answer to you on that is like, those kinds of questions are easy for someone to answer because you string words together that parrot time and place. Mm. But an in-depth thought process to analyze what the zeros might be takes a bit of time. It's not off the cuff. Mm. So I guess I would say in short, I don't know what they are. Uh, that's the entirety of the future is it's gonna be a zeroth order future. Mm. I wanna talk about kernel for a couple mm -hmm. minutes. Um, it's a wearable, as far as I can tell, it's a wearable fMRI. Uh, it seems like MRIs and PET scans are, are sort of tough, but kernel's about getting brain info as easily as stepping on a scale or something like that. Um, in the context of, I guess, the neurology there, first of all, why didn't you go the route of like a Neuralink, maybe implantable device? Um, and second of all, what do most people not understand about where this technology is going? Yeah. Um, so I, I became the most measured person in human history through Blueprint. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that one of the hardest things to measure is my brain. And my brain's important to me. I want to know what's going on there. I want to know what affects my brain. 
How does sleep affect my brain and diet and exercise? What do, how do certain friends like, affect my brain? How does my environment? Uh, psychedelics, you know, I did uh, ketamine as a pilot participant at Colonel. So I have all these questions and I just don't know. Mm. And so we built that device to basically say, we want to make your brain as easily measured as anything else. And I want to, um, you know, science begins with counting. And right now we can't count our brain. We can't put, assign numbers to it. It's this subjective thing we have. So Kernel introduces uh, rigorous science around our brains. And that's what I hope to do. And we've built the device. So seven years in, most people thought it was impossible to do. And I wanted to do it because implants are, are they have their place. Like they're definitely extremely useful. There's over 300 people, 300,000 people with, with implants right now. Uh, but you're not going to scale to a billion people with implants in any time frame that's realistic. You're going to be at a hyper-focused thing. So if you want to build this for the masses and you want to imagine us building the future in a structured way with our brains, you have to go non-invasive. Mm. And that's why I made the change with Kernel is I knew implantables would have some small market. Like, say, like even if, if Neuralink becomes the, like a wild success, it's like a million implants. Mm -hmm. you know, that's like a huge, huge number. Where this non-invasive, you could get to billions of people. And then you start systematically. And they're different technologies, they do different things, but I really wanted to work out a species level scale on how do you build our cognition going into the future. What did ketamine do? Yeah, <laughs> it was really cool to see. So you, imagine you see planet Earth and you see a bunch of airports around the Earth. And so you see traffic patterns between Tokyo and New York. Mm. So you see big traffic patterns and you see small airports and small cities where there's not much. That's the same with our brain. We have these big networks of communication and then smaller networks. Mm. And your network patterns tell things about you. So there's patterns in there. And so I had my patterns mapped. I looked at my, my brain was scanned. Uh, I had the, the kernel system on my head for uh, seven minutes a day for five days before. And then during ketamine and then uh, a month afterwards. And I saw all my networks change. And the cool thing that happened is my networks were all very stable for five days. And then I did ketamine and it washed my networks. Like it basically, it just scrapped where Tokyo and New York were. It just scrambled the, the entire globe. And then over the, the five days after that, my networks rebuilt themselves up to similar patterns. But there was a two to three day window where my networks were just washed. Mm. And that's the therapeutic window that a lot of people talk about is when you're doing that and you're trying to rebuild yourself and build new patterns of self, that's the window. So we saw my patterns dissolve and then rebuild and we saw that window. So it was cool. And then, you know, of course, there's other information in the patterns that themselves, but mm. it was cool to see my cognition in data. Mm. So whether it's kernel or blueprint um, and this, this like process of measurement to what we were talking about earlier, like how far would you go with this person? Would you, would you start like a hardware company? Because um, it seems like measurement, I think, is, is really at the core of not just what we were talking about earlier and getting people to like yeah. in real time understand the impact that it's having on yeah. them, um, but also more broadly, um, it, it feels like things are moving in that direction. Yeah, I mean, I, I had an interesting perspective. I grew up in a community that was a storytelling community. It was religious. Mm -hmm. And religions thrive on story. You know, uh, most religions are not going out and trying to quantify, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. uh, was the earth you know, built in six days or not? Yeah. So it's, it's a story-based religion. So I grew up that way. And then I read Gary Becker was a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist from the University of Chicago. I stumbled upon his book, Economics of Life, and he took... Uh, topics like any topic, like poverty or religion or something else, and then he would explain it explain it in terms of economics. Uh, Freakonomics is a book that came along later and did the same thing, but it was like this. It was one of my favorite moments of life where I thought, "You're kidding me! <laughs> Reality can be explained numerically. Mm. It's not just a story. I, I can see graphs and math and formulas." And it was one of the biggest moments of my entire life. And since I've I've really gravitated towards trying to understand reality numerically. Story's awesome, it definitely has its place. Like we still, like I tell stories, right, with Blueprint. Yeah. Uh, I really like numbers, I like data, I like math. And I've just really gravitated towards because I think if we're trying to build a future and lessen the risk of uh, this whole fun thing ending, like existential realities for the species or even myself and others that we're going to be more likely to be successful if we are rigorous and scientific 
about the ways in which you do it. Mm. And not to say that that's the only way, but it definitely is a really nice tool to have in conjunction with story. But to me, it's just like, it's so amazing to be alive. I'm so happy I'm alive. You know, I, yes, it's like life has been hard and, yeah. and it very, it's hard a lot, but um, I really don't want it to end. Mm. I want to talk about OS Fund yeah. for a little bit. Um, you have a fund called OS Fund. Uh, I think broadly, as far as I understand, it operates under the thesis that every major technological change happens at the foundational level. Um, so OS Fund, OS Fund invests in, in sort of like the, the operating, si operating system kind of infrastructural level that, that you know, applications or new technologies get, get built on top of. Um, what technologies are you most excited by right now that don't touch Blueprint or Kernel? Yeah. Yeah, the origin of OS Fund is after selling Braintree Venmo, I, um, with that 25th century thought experiment, mm. it seemed to me that I needed to get an education in the fields of biology and material science and computational therapeutics and, 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 and like all deep tech. And I needed to do it fast. Mm. And so I decided to create the fund and invest in these companies. So I did make investments in synthetic biology, precision care, uh, chemistry, computational therapeutics. And I got to hang out with the founders in the trenches doing their thing. Mm. And it was incredibly helpful to, to see a PhD entrepreneur go from their primary area of expertise and then try to identify some commercializable thing to do it. Mm. And uh, fortunately, the, the fund was a success. I mean, I, uh, maybe I lucked out <laughs> <laughs> because it, it was a brand new field. I had never, uh, I had never really uh, learned science outside of, you know, basic stuff in high school and college. Yeah. And uh, but being in there and practically learning the game was really helpful. But yeah, but some of the companies, like uh, I was first money in Ginkgo Bioworks, which has come to be like the dominant yeah. provider. Uh, I'm bullish on them that uh, they will be able to be a critical player for DNA infrastructure in the world. Like I think they will change the, the game. And then another company, Numat, which is doing uh, metal organic frameworks. So they assemble, part of, they assemble matter uh, atom by atom which you know, like when I map this to longevity and I say, okay, so if we understand the aging processes, we have these tools to like, you can take an E. coli, mm -hmm. reprogram it to do what you want, like produce rose oil. So instead of doing a rose plant, just like make it, like have it make it. And same when you assemble atoms and like Legos, we have these structural abilities now to build stuff in the body. And so to me, when you pair these fields and you layer on top of that, artificial intelligence generally is just getting better at all things. It is this moment where it's like, we can kind of do anything. We, we, we are now finally <clears throat> the architects of reality. Uh, physical reality, biological reality, our perceived reality, we now can engineer it mm -hmm. for the first time. It's like a dream, it'd be a dreamland for Da Vinci. You know, like Da Vinci really played in that world. Uh, he did it with his mind and in his sketch, but this is really the manifestation of that. We've talked a lot about like measurement and, and to your point earlier with, with Becker's book, um, like the quantification of things that maybe you didn't realize were quantifiable mm -hmm. early on. And so as we index more and more of the world around us and we're able to kind of make sense of that numerically, um, and I guess presumably with the pretense there, in a world of just more efficient markets, um, what do you think funding technology starts to look more like? Do you see yeah. that shifting in any real way? Mm. I don't think I have anything useful to say on this topic. Fair enough. <clears throat> okay, home stretch. Um, you mentioned sort of early on in life, you developed a pretty strong distrust of authority um, and a more recent appreciation that you can't always trust your own thoughts, your own yeah. judgment, yeah. Um, given cognitive biases. Given the deeply religious background early in life, I think there's some sort of saying that like in all of us, there's a God-shaped hole, right? Do you think you're like, do you think you've made a deity of data hmm. in any way? Uh, I mean, so like <clears throat> growing up, I, I trusted adults yeah. like most kids do. Yeah. And then I found out that adults were not much different than kids. <laughs> and then I trusted institutions. And then I learned what institutions are like and their strengths and their weaknesses. And then I trusted, you know, so I've basically, like, I've gone, then I trusted myself and then I learned about my cognitive biases and then I stopped trusting myself and then I got depressed and I realized that 
I, it wasn't me that was saying, go kill yourself. Right. So I basically have gone through this process of distrusting everything. Hmm. Like, who do we trust and why? And it's hard to say. Like, I mean, really, like reliably, who or what, what, who and what do we trust? Hmm. And so data, even though data and statistics are not trustworthy in of themselves, because you can spin any story you want, it is to me potentially one of the more interesting sources of authority. Yeah. Not to say it should be followed blindly, not to say it's like, you know, clean cut. It is to say that it's a really helpful thing uh, when you can introduce that into the equation. And, you know, when I love this, uh, well, I'm not going to get into it, but like, yeah, when... Um, when I contemplate how to take care of myself, I am not as good as an algorithm. When I'm deciding on the whim, what I want, if I'm going to read blogs and put together notes from books read and like listen to people talk, I'm never going to compete versus just measurement and looking at the, uh, the protocols. And um, so I, I wouldn't say it's a DD out of data, but I would say um, we may be wise to find a complementary source of wisdom, because right now we've propped up our minds as the ultimate authority. And this is the funny thing again about the 25th century. We currently, our minds are the best place for wisdom in, in society. Now there's been a few places where data and algorithms have come in, like getting to a destination via digital navigation, right? And there's like a few areas in society where like, yep, legit better, yeah. and we all accept it. Uh, and that's just going to happen more and more frequently. But really, the human mind as the dominant source of authority and wisdom is going down very rapidly. And computational intelligence is moving up very rapidly. And it's going in different paths. And we never know which ones are going to hit and when. But it is a trend that is very hard to wager against. Two more for you. Yeah. You sold Braintree Venmo for $800 million dollars. Not very many people have the you know, privilege of experiencing something of that magnitude. I'm curious from your perspective, you know, it's been a little while now looking back, how did wealth change you? Mm. Yeah, th these kinds of questions, I think it's always best to ask others <laughs> because they're more percept perceptive of you than you are yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, I really wanted money because I wanted to be involved in something that would change the course of human history, of intelligence in the galaxy. That's really all I've cared about ever. Mm. I've never cared about uh, rich people things. Mm. A yacht or like big expensive homes, I really have only cared about effectuating change. It's the only thing on my, my mind ever. And money is really useful when you're chasing that. And it's hard, like if you, I mean, when I look back on the biographies I've read, when you look at the number of things and people that are remembered from the previous centuries, it's unbelievably small. Mm -hmm. And to try to compete for a spot in that is challenging. And that's where my mind is all the time. And so money is just simply a vehicle, but no one cares about someone's wealth in a previous time and place. They care about what they did with it. Yeah. So that's definitely my relationship with money. What would you be working on if you weren't doing... Blueprint, Kernel, OS Fund. I mean, I, I looked at everything. I, I really did. And I mean, there's only a few things going on right now. Uh, I mean, artificial intelligence is the dominant thing. Um, how do we not destroy ourselves as a species? You know, like how do we not nuke each other or do some kind of bioterror weapon? How do we not destroy our planet, mm -hmm. the biosphere? And then how do we actually build a future that we can participate in? Mm. Outside of that, there's not really anything else going on. And when I look at those things, I look at all four and I say, you can collapse all four into Don't Die. It, Don't Die is the most played game every day in the world by everyone. There's no game played more by more people than Don't Die. I ask one question at the end of every interview I do with anyone. It's the same thing. Inside or outside the scope of anything we spoke about, what should more people be thinking about? Yeah. Hey, friend. So this would be my take. That reality 
is structured around first principles thinking. We try to, we work with things we know and we are the stewards of knowledge and first principles. Our future is going to be dominated by zeroth principle discoveries and thinking, basically not knowing. And so while intelligence right now is all about knowing, intelligence of the future is going to be able to act when not knowing. And so the, to make this tangible, uh, in 2017, I was in the Middle East with a, a leader in the country. And he said, here's my 2030 goals. I said, that's amazing. How can you plan 13 years in advance when the world's going to change many times over before that point in time? And he said, what would you do? And so I, I made up a thought experiment on the spot. And I said, let's imagine we have two robots. We want to get the robots to the distant part in the sand dune. The robot, uh, first robot, we're going to do a topographical map of the sand dune. And then we're going to set it off. And the problem with that is the robot's going to be stuck in the sand when the terrain shifts right when it starts. The other robot, you program the robot with the tools it needs to navigate shifting, shifting sands, and then just give it the GPS coordinates for the horizon. That robot has a higher probability of arriving at its destination because it doesn't care how the terrain shifts. And so I would suggest that people plan for and build the skills for zeroth principle reality, where we don't know what's coming. And we are robust enough and anti-fragile enough that we can navigate our existence with success, thriving on the fact that we don't know. I think that's a good enough as place as, as any to, to leave it off. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you yep. so much. Yep, thank you.